everything we have to fear is in war. Fear there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor, for our sons and daughters, ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome to Wall Builders Live. This is the intersection of faith and politics. You can find out more about us on our websites at wallbuilders.com and wallbuilderslive.com. David Barton here. I'm Rick Green. David, I got uh, I, I got to think that the best place when we say faith and politics to learn about that intersection and how our faith should affect all those different areas ought to be in our churches, right? Well, you would think so. And, and let, let me back up. It shouldn't be in our church. It ought to be in the Bible. Uh, re- regardless of, of what pastors say, we should have enough folks in the pews that know what the Bible says, that if he gets it wrong, we can jump the pastor. Yeah, good point. We're at a point today where we don't, the citizens don't know it. It's like having a politician who says, oh, it, it, you know, the, the, the Constitution guarantees that you do, you do not get to own guns. It's only for the military. Well, we ought to, as citizens, jump and say, no, 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 it's not what the Second Amendment says. Here's what it says. And we, as citizens that are informed in the Constitution, can stop our political guys from getting off course. Same thing in the church. If we know the Bible, we can stop our pastors from getting off course. And right now, uh, in, in many parts of the country, there's no question pastors are getting off course. We've talked in previous programs how that I'm, I'm part of a group and, and, and with George Barn and others where that they're calling 600 churches a day and asking them five of the most basic elementary questions um, that, that relate to, to biblical beliefs and values, and we're only getting one out of four churches agree with the five easiest things. So easy to say that the church is really off course today, but it wouldn't be if citizens jump the, the pastors like they jump guys who misquote the Constitution. And let me give you an example. We have between 78 and 82 percent of the nation that says, I'm a Christian. That's what they self-identify as. And, and the numbers vary. I mean, sometimes it goes lower, sometimes higher. I've seen as high as 88. I've sent it down to 71 percent. But generally, around 80 percent say, I'm a Christian. All right. You're a Christian because that's because you adhere to what the Bible teaches about Christianity, because that is the source of Christianity is the Bible. So if you're a Christian, it's because of what you, what you believe uh, from what the Bible teaches. I mean, it's, it's not like I, I'm Chinese or I'm French or something else because I moved there. To profess Christianity, that is a faith set forth in the Bible. Now, having said that, with eight out of ten Americans saying I'm Christian, listen to this. This is current polling. This is from the book U-Turn that George Barn and I did together. Uh, this book U-Turn, there's a section here talking about what we as Christian people, as churchgoers, as Americans believe today. When asked, do you believe the following behavior is moral? When people were asked, an unmarried woman having a baby, is that moral or not moral? The answer was it's moral. But do you know by what percent people thought that was moral? Probably about half. 67% thought it was moral for an unmarried woman to have a baby. Wow. Now, try that 20 years ago, and you're going to be exactly the opposite. Um, here's another one. 69% of Americans think getting divorced divorce is moral. Uh, 66% think that sexual relationship between an unmarried man and woman is moral. Grab this. 65% think that uh, medical research on, on stem cells from human living human embryos is moral. Uh, 63% think that having sexual thoughts or fantasies about someone you're not married to, they think that is moral. Uh, 63% say that living with someone of the opposite sex without being married is moral. 58% say that homosexuality is moral. I mean, just I keep going through the percentages. These are appalling, amazing percentages that two thirds to three fourths to four fifths of the nation says, "Oh yeah, this is this behavior is moral." I'm sorry, there is not a single verse you can find anywhere in that Bible from which you claim you profess your faith that agrees with any of that. And so it really is a situation of Matthew seven verses twenty one to twenty three where that. Uh, all these people in, in the judgment say, hey, Lord, I knew you, and, and I was one of you, and I, I use your name. And he said, I don't know you. I, you didn't do anything I said to do. And it's it, it's Matthew seven twenty one where he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. And if we don't know his will, we won't do his will, and you won't know his will because you just think you know what it is. You have to know it because he tells us in his guidebook. And if we don't read his guidebook, we won't know it. 
And so the problem we have with pastors in the pulpit is largely a reflection of the problem we have with Christians in general, that they don't know what the book says and they don't know what's moral and immoral out of the book. And as a consequence, it becomes whatever they feel like, whatever side of the bed they got up on in the morning, whatever the first program they popped on was. I mean, we're getting our morality from who knows where, but as Christians, it's no longer out of the book. So I guess the blame lays, you know, is it the both sets of feet? It's the it's the pastor if they're not teaching the congregation that, but the congregation can't just depend on the pastor. Congregation, we've got to be in the Word as well in order to know that truth and recognize whether it's coming from the pulpit or not. Well, you know, in James three one, we're told that the leaders will be judged more harshly because leaders should have known better. Now you have a pastor who has paid money to be in the book and to teach the book, and if you've got a pastor who has paid money to be in the book and teach the book and doesn't teach what's in the book. He gets a harder judgment than the others. So there is, I don't care how bad your pastor is. I don't care what he believes. That is no excuse for you not believing what's right because you can read the book and know it. But for the pastor's standpoint, if he's not teaching what's in the book, including about the morals that the Bible sets forth, then he gets a bigger judgment than those in, in the pews who don't do it. And, and that's not my opinion. That is James 3, 1, where the scripture says that, that the leader, the, the one who expounds the truth, if he doesn't do it, he gets a bigger judgment than, than those who, who aren't the leader. So it, it is a big deal, and pastors have to be held responsible, but having a, a pastor that doesn't talk about biblical morality is not an excuse for you not knowing it or applying it or doing it. You can't stand before God and say, my gosh, my pastor didn't tell me that. And God says, I, I gave you the book. Did, didn't I mean, you had time to read all the other books, and you were on Audible, and, and you had all these audio books, and, and, and you had plenty of time on TV, and, and you didn't read my book? You know, there's there's not an excuse that's going to work for that. So we do have to know the book, and we're at a point now where the Christianity is starting to reflect that we think more like pagans than we do anything biblically. Our friend Rob uh, Schwartzwalder from Family Research Council had an article recently about uh, the Bible not getting in their way, talking about evangelicals, um, you know, really celebrating homosexual relations and all kinds of things that they're that are totally anti-biblical, but saying, hey, you know, that's uh, that's the new evangelical faith. Well, you know, it's it's interesting that one of the articles that recently has been out is uh, it, it highlights seven of the strongest faith individuals in, in national business that would surprise you to know who they are. And it goes through and, and, and shows uh, the guy over Affleck. I believe he's Roman Catholic. He's very strong about his faith. And it goes through these stuff. And, and one of the businesses is Apple. And the, the new head of Apple says the greatest gift that God has given him is his homosexuality. That Wait a minute. Here, here is a open faith guy, and he says the greatest gift God has given me is my homosexuality. I'm sorry, First Corinthians says that the homosexual will not enter heaven. Huh? I wonder where he got the belief that the greatest gift God gave him was says, well, he hadn't read the book. And so, you know, the the article by Rob is is really indicative of the fact that across the the sphere of of Christianity. We're starting to believe what we want or what the culture says rather than what God clearly says in his book and what we've adopted for 5,500 years. And so one of the, the folks who's really on the cutting edge of this is Al Mohler, uh, head of the Baptist Seminary. And, uh, I mean, these, these guys are right in the middle of this. They're having debates in their denomination over this. And Al has been an unwavering, unflinching voice on biblical authority. And we thought it would be really good to get Al to comment on that article. We'll have him when we come back from the break. As we go to break, David, I can't help but think, I mean, how would people respond to a CEO that might say, you know, because God doesn't see sexual sin any different, whether it's homosexual or, or outside of marriage in any way, how would they feel if a CEO said, God's greatest gift to me is my infidelity to my wife? Exactly right. I Good don't call. think they would be singing his praises. Back in a moment, Dr. Al Mohler with us as our special guest today here on Wobbler's Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Christians have always believed that the greatest life-changing experience available to any individual is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and the testimonies of numerous converts confirm the dramatic changes which often accompany salvation. One such testimony of change comes from founding father Noah Webster, who explained, I was led by a spontaneous impulse to repentance, prayer, and entire submission and surrender of myself to my Maker and Redeemer. I now began to understand and relish many parts of the scriptures which before appeared mysterious and unintelligible. In short, my view of the scriptures, of religion, of the whole Christian scheme of salvation, and of God's moral government are very much changed. 
the power of God to change a life yielded to Him was just as evident at the time of the Founding Fathers as it still is today. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Welcome back to the Intersection of Faith and Politics. This is Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, we're honored today to have Dr. Al Moeller with us. He's currently president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. That's the flagship school for the Southern Baptist Convention. They do a great job. Dr. Moeller, thank you so much for coming on. I'm very glad to be with you. Well, we're, um, you know, we're watching some of this uh, transformation in evangelical communities across the nation. And uh, our friend uh, Rob Schwartzwalder from Family Research Council a very interesting article about the Bible not getting in the way of what's happening in a lot of churches across America. And David said, man, we got to get Dr. Moeller on and get his thoughts on this. I know you've been watching it. You've actually responded to uh, the book by uh, Vines. Uh, what, what do you say about what's happening out there, and how do we counter it? Well, you know, the most interesting thing, and very disappointing, but I guess predictable, is that the arguments that made their way through liberal Protestantism say, uh, 5 to 10 to 20 years ago, and now finding their way into circles that call themselves evangelical. But we've got to be very clear what's going on here. Uh, this is a subversion of biblical authority. It's a, it's a direct denial of what is very clear in Scripture. And, uh, of course, it's not just biblical authority that's at stake. Ultimately, the gospel is at stake. It seems like the you know the the one issue that gets um, the, the the most press and 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 is the one that they're leading with is the homosexual issue, but it's not just that issue. I mean, it's really a, a question of the inherency of the scripture. Well, you're so right because it's never just this issue or that issue. Because Christianity is a comprehensive whole, uh, you begin to uh, compromise at one point, inevitably it bleeds over into other points as well. So. We shouldn't be surprised that the very same people who are flirting with these revisionist biblical interpretations on the issue of homosexuality are also those that are likely to be in the wrong place on the inerrancy of Scripture. They're likely to be in the wrong place on the exclusivity of the gospel and on any number of other issues as well. How much is it, Dr. Muller, the, the seminaries themselves? I mean, are we are we training our our leaders in the church to be prepared for these kind of battles? Well, I can promise you that that's what I give my attention to full-time, 24-7. That, that, that's my obsession. And, and there are some very fine seminaries out there, I'm thankful to say, very very fine, faithful seminaries. But uh, you'll know where those seminaries are because they're going to be flying the bold colors of biblical conviction, where there's a seminary that's giving an uncertain sound, and there are all, all too many of those. Or seminaries that are actually fountainheads of liberalism, well, we shouldn't expect they're going to produce graduates who are going to defend the faith. What what if you're a um, you know you're a congregant and you're looking for a good church? And what are some good signs of a pastor that is going to speak truth from the Word of God and not compromise versus those that are buying into this feel good Christianity? You know, I think that's a great question, and I think one of the new things we now know to look for is uh, the fact that those colors are being flown pretty boldly because. A pastor is trying to run under the radar on these things is, uh, is at best quiet where he should be speaking, and at worst is on his way to a bad place in terms of compromise. So, you know, if you have to ask the church where it stands and over any length of time, if you have to ask, what does the pastor believe on these issues, where does this church stand on these issues, then you already should know you've got trouble. Mm. I like the way you said that, where they're, they're quiet where they would should be speaking. That's right. What are some of those issues that, that, that pastors should not be ignoring in the culture today? Well, you know, when you take the issue of, of sexuality and marriage in this culture, you're looking at the forward edge of that great moral revolution that's been taking place for the better part of the last, say, quarter century, but is actually moving so fast that, uh, that if we don't get our bearings quickly, then uh, we're simply going to lose the very definition of marriage, which is one of God's greatest gifts to humanity— the first institution he created and gave to, to human society. We're, we're going to lose all of that if we don't understand that we've got to be talking about marriage, we've got to be talking about God's pattern of sexuality, we've got to be talking about why children, according to the biblical vision, need a mother and a father. We've got to be talking about why God's plan from the beginning is that which leads to human flourishing and human happiness. Uh, we've got to be talking about the whole set of issues. You know, Martin Luther, the great performer, said that if we are silent at the very one point where the Bible is being subverted or where truth is being denied, we become, in essence, the enemy of the gospel. 
The sin of silence, no doubt about it. What what can a what can a congregate do to encourage their pastor to be bold in these areas? What's the right way to approach them? Quick break, and we'll get the answer to that question from Dr. Albert Moeller. He's our guest today. You can visit his website at albertmoeller.com. We'll have a link today at wallbuilderslive.com. Stay with us here on Wallbuilders Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. As Christians become more active in politics, they must remember to elevate principles above party loyalty. Perhaps the best illustration of this comes from the life of founding father Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence who served in the presidential administrations of John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison, each of whom was from a different political party. When Benjamin Rush was asked of his personal party affiliation, he responded, I've been alternately called an aristocrat and a democrat. I am neither. I am a Christocrat. I believe all power will fail of producing order and happiness in the hands of man. He alone who created and redeemed man is qualified to govern him. Like Benjamin Rush, we too must remain Christocrats regardless of our personal party affiliation. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. We're back. Thanks for staying with us here on Wall Builders Live. Our guest today, Dr. Albert Moeller. He's the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Moeller, in the first segment, we were talking about the need for, for pastors to speak up and, and, and not fall into that sin of silence. What, what about the congregants? I mean, what can a, a congregant do to encourage their pastor to speak out and be bold? Well, that's, a, that's such a great question. I would say the first thing a faithful layperson needs to do is to say to his pastor or her pastor, look, I got your back on this. Uh, you're not alone in believing these things, and you're speaking to people who expect you to teach the Bible, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, to uh, to proclaim the, the Scripture in season and out of season. And when you do it, we've got your back. I think that is absolutely vital. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's no different than, I mean, I'm a former legislator, so I come from that perspective. In the same way, you want to know you've got constituents out there that have your back when you lead boldly. On an issue, I think pastors in many ways are in the same boat as legislators. I mean, they're trying to, they got all these people from different backgrounds in the church and pressure from all kinds of directions. They need to be bold, but it's nice to know you got people in the church that, uh, that, are, that are supporting you to do that. You know, one of the, the most frightening questions asked in Scripture is when Jesus asked his disciples in Luke 18, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Uh, that's a bracing question, a humbling question. The Lord speaking to his own disciples. And it's just a reminder to us that we are just in every generation facing the fact that if we don't evangelize and train up our own children, then the entire battle is lost. And uh, so that's one of the things we should be saying to the pastor and to and, and to the entire leadership of the church. Look, aim at our children. We've got your back. You know, look at the war they're going to face for the rest of their lives. Get them ready for it. How about the, the, the whole Houston thing and, and pastors being called out for speaking on, on an issue that was, you know, a, an obvious, a plain issue, this, this bathroom bill out of, out of Houston that other states are, have already uh, adopted? Um, you know, pastors were uh, willing to stand in that case, and the government came after them, and then they stood even stronger. It was very encouraging to see pastors stand up and, and push back, and the, and the government backed down. What, what, were you encouraged by that? I was encouraged by the pastor's response, but isn't it discouraging to think that here you had a mayor of an American city who uh, felt she had the right to, to subpoena sermons from evangelical pastors. I mean, and you, and you private correspondence, just, not just the sermons, yeah. the private correspondence. Absolutely. But it, I mean, if, if that were the mayor of Moscow or the mayor of Beijing, that might make some sense to us. But for crying out loud, that's the mayor of Houston, Texas. That's right. And that tells us what we're up against. You know, every time there's a moral revolution— the, the new regime seeks to coerce that new moral code, and they'll use everything available to them. And one of the things I talk about as much as anything else these days is the inevitable collision between erotic liberty and religious liberty. And uh, that's going to be a challenge every preacher is going to face. Mm. I, this wasn't part of our interview, but i got to ask you, as someone that is, is training up a new generation of, uh, of pastors and leaders in, in ministry, what do you see from this rising generation with regard to, to truth and, and absolute truth versus this moral relativism that is seeping into the, 
into the church. How do you how do you kind of measure this next group of of young leaders coming up? Well, I will say that uh, what we have is a generation, we do want to call them the millennials, that is in general extremely confused. Uh, I refer to them as the lab rats of modernity. If, if you want to see what the modern age produces, if you want to see what secularism and moral relativism produces, just look at the millennials. But that's the bad news. The good news is out of that generation is coming a core of young Christians who've been swimming against the tide from the time they were in elementary school. They stand for Christ, they stand for the gospel, and they are suffering under no illusions about why the truth is important or how costly it's going to be to serve Christ. Mm. And, you know, the the encouragement should be it's the conservative seminaries, the conservative Christian schools that are flying the colors of biblical fidelity most boldly that have the students coming to them. That should tell us something that's very encouraging. Oh, that is. is. I guess they they get to be the rebels of today, don't they? And standing for truth, they're kind of rebelling against the counterculture right now. Yeah, you know, what we have to do is is raise up a generation of subversives and counter-revolutionaries, and, and, and that's what we have the privilege of doing. Yeah, that's exciting. Dr. Mueller, what, what a great uh, positive word in, in, in the midst of so much negativity out there. We so appreciate you and what you're doing. Appreciate you coming on the program today and encouraging us. Look forward to having you back again soon. It'll be a privilege. It's important to talk about these things, and this was a worthy conversation. I thank you for it. That's Dr. Al Mueller. We'll have a link to his website today. Back in a moment with David Barton. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the United States Constitution but just felt like, man, the classes are boring or it's just that old language from 200 years ago or I don't know where to start? People want to know, but it gets frustrating because you don't know where to look for truth about the Constitution either. Well, we've got a special program for you available now called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. And it's actually a teaching done on the Constitution at Independence Hall in the very room where the Constitution was framed. We take you both to Philadelphia, the Cradle of Liberty and Independence Hall, and to the Wall Builders Library, where David Barton brings the history to life to teach the original intent of our founding fathers. We call it the Quick Start Guide to the Constitution because in just a few hours through these videos, you will learn the Citizen's Guide to America's Constitution. You'll learn what you need to do to help save our constitutional republic. It's fun, it's entertaining, and it's going to inspire you to do your part to preserve freedom for future generations. It's called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. You can find out more information on our website now at wallbuilders.com. Welcome back to Wall Builders Live. Thanks for staying with us. Special thanks to Dr. Al Moeller and the good work they do at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. David, I, f- I feel a little better about seminaries after that interview. I'm, I'm, I'm usually very worried about what's coming out, but uh, obviously uh, it's great to have somebody like that with good moral clarity and, and uh, clear biblical knowledge uh, teaching this next generation. Yeah, that's one seminary you're not going to have to worry about. As, as uh, Dr. Moeller pointed out, there are plenty that we do have to worry about, but that's not one that, that have made it. But, you know, there were some interesting things that really stood out because before we went to the break, and, and I love the, the analogy you made, look, any kind of sexual sin outside the bounds of what God has said, whether it's sex outside of marriage, uh, premarital sex or extramarital sex with adultery, homosexuality, I mean, God's made it really clear how, when, and what sex is about. And, and that anything outside of that is wrong. And so for the, the, the guy from Apple to say, the greatest gift God has given me is, is my homosexuality, it really struck me when Dr. Mueller said, God's greatest gift to humanity is what? It's the definition of marriage. You know, that's he hadn't heard what what we said about uh, about the the apple guy, but there's the rebuttal to it. Yeah, what a contrast. What a contrast. The greatest gift God gave to humanity is the definition of marriage. And you know, I also appreciate what he said that if you have a pastor who's trying to run under the radar on this issue, he's headed for a bad place. And if you don't know where your church stands on this issue, your church is in trouble. And that's exactly right. I mean, if we're not taking the position the Bible has taken, then we're not taking a biblical position, and, and that's a real problem. Uh, the other thing that, you know, I don't know how many times I've read through the Bible. And I go back to something the last Budno said, founding father who had read through the Bible like 50 times, and he said, every time I read it, I see something I've never seen before. And as many times as I've gone through it, when Dr. Moeller quoted out of Luke 18, and he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, I've always considered that like a rhetorical question, like, oh, of course he will, but, you know. But what if it's a literal question? I mean, what what if we get to the point where we burn out our own faith 
When the Son of Man comes, will he find biblical faith in America? You know, he will somewhere in the world, but how about America? Wow. You know, that's that's a really mm-hmm. powerful question because yeah. we're messing with the verges of that now when, when you know, evangelicals, you know, and something Dr. Mueller said at the beginning was um, the, the bad arguments that made their way through liberalism a couple of decades ago are now becoming mainstream in evangelicalism. You know, that's bad news. So it's like when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Will he find biblical faith in America? And that's that's going to really be up to us. Yeah, true faith. Not uh, you know. I mean, we we we've allowed that word faith to be faith in anything now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the the uh, true faith based on moral absolutes, I would think, is what he was really asking. Well, we we live in a period where that we don't have moral absolutes. I mean, I read a lot of those stats at the front out of that U-turn book. And with that, I love what he said. He said, "Look, we have to raise up a generation of subversives and counter-revolutionaries." And I, yeah, it really is. You know, with the culture so much against us on on traditional biblical values. We are now in a place of being the revolutionaries, the, the counter-revolutionaries. We're, we're in the place of being the subversives and that we're saying, no, wait, guys, there is right and wrong. You know, you know profanity is, is not moral. And by the way, 44% of the nation thinks cussing is, is moral behavior. I mean, even in little things like that that just courtesy say is wrong, uh, we're losing ground. And now we've got to be the ones to push back, and we can do that if we know the Bible. Absolutely, folks. You can find out more at our website, wallbuilderslive.com. You can get the archives of past programs over the last few months. Thanks for listening today. You've been listening to Wall Builders Live.